So I have five five big gaps. I'm going to kind of uh, there's been a lot of uh, Eric already has talked a lot about Bayesian model uncertainty. But I'll, I'll just go through it a little more slowly. Talk about multiple testing, hierarchical modeling, Bayesian big data, and then and then in case there are still frequencies around, I want to talk about something that that is kind of happening in the statistics world where the frequencies and the Bayesians are coming together as we sort of recognize the. the uh, okay, so Bayesian model uncertainty. Um, uh, this is just kind of formulating what, what, what Eric was uh, talking about in, in advanced detail and in, in simple language. Uh, we have we have a, a, a collection of models. I can open models ML, 1 to K. Uh, for example, uh, M sub L could be the model that there are L planets in the star system. We observe some data, could be transit data or, or um, uh, uh, radial velocity data. Uh, has density f of l in an axis theta l, where theta l are the unknown uh, uh, parameters of the planetary system. Um, and, and we have to assign those a prior density pi l of theta l. Uh, Eric referred to a SAMSI program in 2006. I was involved in that, and a lot of the effort in that SAMSI program was trying to decide what are reasonable priors for these uh, parameters of, of uh, planets and the stars. And I'm sure since then, these priors have evolved significantly uh, as, as, as there's been more and more uh, 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 knowledge about, about planetary systems. Uh, in any case, uh, one then uh, takes those inputs and computes the marginal likelihood of the model ML. That's just the, the likelihood times the prior integrated out. I guess, I, guess, I guess you're calling that the evidence now, right? Is that what, I kept hearing Eric use the word evidence. Okay. So, so in statistics, we don't call that the evidence, but I know in physics and, and now uh, uh, astrophysics and astronomy, this, this thing is called the evidence, which is a good name. You know, I mean, in statistics, we, one, of the, one of our problems is we have stupid names. I mean, marginal you know, that's, that, that's technically correct, but it doesn't have the cachet of evidence. Um, anyway, that's, that's, we suffer with that. Uh, okay, then, then you choose prior probabilities for the K models, uh, P and ML for the K models. Um, uh, I actually am not quite sure how, how you do this these days, because after all, we, we, we sort of only have one observation about our own solar system. And even then, I can't remember. We have eight or nine planets. I, I forgot what this is. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, and and, and uh, uh, as, as Eric gave an example of, of, of the transit thing where, where they, they, they could say, for example, okay, we know it's not two planets. We know there's three. But it could be four, five, six, ten. We, we don't know. And so we, we really have a hard time uh, coming up with the prior probabilities of the, the number of planets in the system. Uh, in any case, when you have all that, you just use Bayes' theorem, compute the posterior probability of a model given the data. Uh, here's, the, here's the formula for Bayes' theorem. So I actually did do a bunch of planets many, many years ago, like 10 years ago or something. And, and uh, I remember we were analyzing HD 73526, whatever that was, based on 18 radial velocity measurements. The evidences for the null, the null model, the null planet, was that. Uh, for one planet, model was that. Two planet model is that. If you would say, okay, they, each of these three uh, models has uh, a prior probability of third being correct, uh, then you plug that into the base there and you have the posterior probability of the zero planet model is zero, uh, one planet model is 0.97, and two planet models are 0.03. Uh, later on, there were 30 observations became available, and, and it became clear that the, that the uh, uh, two planet, both the zero planet and the one planet model. Out, uh, so it had to be at least two, maybe higher. You know. Anyway, that's that's just how base theorem works and produces uh, the answers. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna, sort of, I'm gonna hop between. Well, actually, that was my last exoplanet example. Sorry, like I said, I haven't been working in the area for ten years. Um, but you know, statistics is statistics, and I'll, I'll here here's something that's happened recently that that, that might be useful to, to some of you in some contexts, which is sort of a general software package. That does that does um, uh, basically analysis for variable selection, uh, and it's quite automatic. So uh, this is just just basically the, the sort of the ordinary regression setup. You have um, uh, xi's which are following some regression structure, where the zij are covariates, theta j are unknown regression parameters, and you have zero mean Gaussian errors. Uh, and 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 often in this setting, is you is you suspect that some of these theta j's are not needed. Uh, so you have to consider all of the possible submodels where some of these theta j's are equal to zero. 
that ends up being a lot of submodels, and there are a total of two to the K possible models, if you think it through. Um, and in any case, I just want to say that there's a, a, a paper recently where, where there have been many, many proposals for how to deal with this problem in a fully Bayesian way. It's complicated by the fact that you have two to the K models. You know, if K is 100, you have two to the 100 models, which is a lot of models to, to deal with. Uh, and a lot of priors to do, to get all those evidences. Uh, in, any, in any case, I'm just, just saying uh, what we did is we sort of developed a siderata to actually say what are the criteria that any Bayesian model selection methodology should satisfy here. And we developed all of the inputs that you needed to carry this out. Uh, all of the, all of the uh, uh, priors, all of the um, ways of specifying the posterior probabilities, all the kind of a default objective way so it can just be a generic thing you use if you don't have specific prior information. Um, it's a R package, uh, but using C, C languages, so it's fairly so it's fairly efficient. Um, there's a prior, there's different options you have. There's a prior we recommended, we call the robust prior. Uh, and, then, and then there's choices of the model prior probabilities. And we'll talk a little bit more in multiple testing about but the fact that uh, it's, it's quite frequent to choose a constant for the prior model probabilities, saying all models have equal prior probabilities. That turns out uh, to be a bad choice. It does not adjust for multiple testing. I'll have a little bit on that in a minute. Uh, there's a choice recommended by Jeffries. Jeffries was a kind of a famous Bayesian, he's also a famous geophysicist. Uh, and he, in this context, said what you should do is you should decide probability one over k plus one. If there's k possible, uh, the model, the largest model, has k possible parameters here. Um, uh, so you should assign probability 1 over k plus 1 to all models of a given size, and then take that total mass of 1 over k plus 1 and divide it up amongst all the models of that particular size. Uh, and that, that turns out to be a very good uh, assignment of prior probabilities because it does adjust for multiple testing. Um, Eric mentioned that sometimes when you have a complex situation, you have a problem citing how do I get information back from this? So now if I have a setting where I'm looking at two to 100 models, how on earth am I supposed to process uh, all of the information I get back from the Bayesian machine? Uh, it, you know, it obviously doesn't make any sense just looking at individual models and trying to see what's going on. Uh, and, and one of the things that's done is to try to find ways of summarizing the Bayesian information to get uh, 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 quantities that are useful um, and, inter and interpretable. Uh, one, one such basic quantity would be the posterior inclusion probability for a particular variable. So if I want to know that is, is theta 1 I would want to compute the probability that theta 1 should be in the model, that the covariate x1 should be in the model, uh, that theta 1 is not 0. And, and how you find that is you simply sum up, you look at all of the models that contain that variable for which uh, that theta is not zero, for which theta one is not zero. You find all of those models, you add up the posterior probability, and that turns out to be what you want. Um, I, I make a comment here that one of the things that's been discovered in, in, in the statistical world is that if you want to have a single model that's the best predictor, it's usually what is called a median probability model which means you include all of those variables whose posterior inclusion probability is at least a half. It's somewhat surprising that that's the best model. Most people think that, oh, I should find the model with the highest posterior probability, and that would be the best predictor. But in general, that's not true. The median probability model is usually a better predictor. Um, I'll skip this. The optimal Bayesian predictor is doing kind of an average over all possible models. That's called the model average prediction, and that's, that's optimal in some sense, if you're willing to, to not settle by looking at a single model. Um, and, and, and here's a, like, like I said, my examples are uh, unfortunately not astronomy from now on. Uh, here was an example about infant obesity. They were trying to understand which factors affect infant <coughs> obesity. The response variable was body mass index. Body mass index is the square of the height over the weight, something like that. There were 16 explanatory variants, covariates with 1,002 observations. So there's two of the 16th models, um, that many models. Um, you run this code, and, and you just, you just, you know, the, the code is just, you just put in your data and you run the code. It's, it's, it's uh, easy to get here. You can't really see this, but it's not very important. This is just giving the posterior probabilities of various models. 
So here's a model that had the intercept, uh, dad's obesity uh, indicator, mom's obesity indicator, and so forth. And it was the largest model in terms of posterior probability. It had only had posterior probability of 0.09. Uh, and, and, you know, there are 63,000 models, and the posterior probability gets distributed amongst all of them. So that's why you look at things like this, which are these inclusion probabilities. So, well, there's an intercept in the model. Uh, the coefficient of dad being obese is crucial to have in the model. Uh, coefficient of mom being obese is crucial to have in the model. And so forth and so forth. You get down here to uh, vegetarian diet, the fruit diet, those, those are not important to have in the model, uh, and so forth. So, so um, those kind of things are the ways to summarize, you try to find ways to summarize complex uh, Bayesian posteriors by looking at marginal things that are intuitive. Here's something I don't have time to go through, it's an interesting version of saying, if one variable is in a model, what's the probability another one should be? Uh, that, that, that gives you ideas about, about how things are related. All right, so that's just an, an example of Bayesian model uncertainty and, and the kinds of things one has to do because the model spaces can get really big. Uh, multiple testing. So, so again, Eric is referring to a, a number of multiple testing scenarios. I, 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 probably everybody knows it here, but I, I, let, let me, at least for students, just clarify the multiple testing issue. And let, me, let, me, let me do this in a, I was, sit, I was sitting in a, in a talk uh, uh, a number of years ago. Um, and the talk was about the drug discovery process in pharmaceuticals. And as, as the talk was being given, I just randomly started writing down all of the numbers because I found, I found it uh, uh, hilarious. Um, here, here, was, here was the, the talk. It said, uh, and it was, it was trying to describe the way the drug discovery process goes on today. Uh, 10,000 relevant compounds, chemicals, were screened for some kind of biological activity. So there's some target, there's some target disease or something. And, and they're looking. They're looking. They look at ten thousand compounds to try to find if any of them are active against this, this disease in any, in any sense. Uh, Five hundred passed the initial screen and were studied in vitro. Twenty-five passed this screening and were studied in a phase one animal trial. One passed this screening and was studied in a phase two human trial. So I, I, I saw those numbers. And I just started laughing because this could be nothing but noise. The screening was done based on significance at the 0.05 level, as it normally is. Let's just, let's just see. Now, let's assume no compound has any effect whatsoever. There's, there's nothing that's going to affect this disease that's being tested. But what's going to happen? Well, we're testing at the 0.05 level, we're doing 10,000 tests, we're testing 10,000 true null hypotheses. There's nothing going on here. But nevertheless, 5% of the 10,000 will appear significant just by randomness. We know that. 10,000 times 0.05, that's 500. That's, that's, that's what passed the initial screen we've done. Um, these are still, nothing's going on here. These are all just you know, true nulls, just noise. Uh, those 500 are screened at the 0.05 level. How many would pass? 500 times 0.05 is 25. That's the number they gave. Uh, 25, we're now studying phase one animal trials, starting to get into money. It's starting to get into you know, a few million dollars or something. Uh, uh, 25 passed that screening. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, one passed that screening. Well, 25 times 0.05 is not quite in 1.25. It's not even an injury. But nevertheless, it's totally compatible with one passing this screening going to a phase two human trial of maybe $50 million. So, so all this happened, uh, and, 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 and it's completely compatible with nothing, just noise. With, with, with nothing uh, happening at all here. So now we go to an expensive phase two human trial and, and it will pre presumably reveal that there's nothing with noise. Um, so, so that's the multiple testing problem. When you do lots of tests, you just have to adjust for it. And, and uh, what, my, my point of raising this is that uh, in Bayesian analysis, you actually have to be a little careful how, how you deal with multiple testing problems. It doesn't automatically deal with the multiple testing problem. And so here's a very simple uh, scenario of, of Bayesian multiple testing. Suppose I have Xi that's just normal with mean mu i variance sigma squared. Uh, and I, I'm now testing that each Xi has a different mu i. And I want to test uh, mu i zero versus mu i not zero. Okay? And each of these null hypotheses could be true or false regardless of the others. So I have a large number of tests, uh, each of which could be true or false. And I now have to set up a Bayesian analysis of this problem. 
But one might say, okay, let me just say, um, the simplest thing to do, and what Bayesians uh, often do if they just had, say, one of these tests, is they'd say, okay, I'll have the prior probability of each of the hypotheses be a half. Okay, that seems simple, seems objective. Uh, if you do that, it does, not, it does not control for multiple testing at all. You'll be back in the scenario of, of what, what happened here. If you apply that Bayesian test to these scenarios, you'll end up not controlling for multiple testing. So you have to be, you have to be careful. You have to make sure you're not the um, uh, and, and the method, the, the way to induce multiplicity control is actually quite simple. Here's the, here's the problem again. Uh, uh, we're, we're testing, we have a whole series of data based on different means. We're trying to test whether they're zero or not. Um, uh, and what, what's natural to do and what works is to say, let P denote the common prior probability of H1i. I'm not going to specify it to be a half like we did here. I'm going to say, all right, there's, there's, there's some, there's some um, these, are, these, are, these are all similar in my mind in some ways. Uh, so I can talk about P as the probability that the alternative hypotheses are true, or maybe the proportion of alternatives that are true. With that. And then the key is to assume that P is unknown. It turns out that that does provide complete multiplicity control uh, and quite strong multiplicity control. Strong both from a Bayesian viewpoint and from a frequency viewpoint. So, so when we're building Bayesian models where, where uh, there's multiple testing involved, one has to remember to do something like that. One has to introduce, uh, and this is partly hierarchical Bayes, introduce uh, unknowns and, and let that unknown be part of the model at the next level of the hierarchical model. Give it a prior distribution, and then everything works out just fine. The base machine controls for multiplicity. Um, in this problem, you have to you have to complete specifications of, of the prior distributions. That's just the prior. That just results in specification of the prior probability of the model. Uh, so here, you then have to say, what are, what's my distribution for the mu y? Uh, uh, and quite, quite natural to say it follows a normal zero v distribution. The non-zero means are centered around uh, the null, but with a, 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 a distribution with unknown uh, uh, spread v. And then you have to assign v uh, a prior, and sort of the usual objective uh, or conventional prior density that's used here is that. Uh, and that completes the Bayesian classification of the model. You now just uh, uh, go and do some Bayesian computation. In this particular one, it's not, it's not so convenient to do MCMC. It's actually uh, uh, much easier simply to write out the posterior probability of each model uh, in terms of an expression that you can, you can deal with more or less analytically. Uh, each of these integrals has to be computed by important sampling, but it can be done very efficiently. Uh, and, 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 and you get the posterior inclusion probabilities. These are the probabilities that the mu i's are not zero. I, have, I had a little example here just showing how it controls for multiplicity but I think I'll, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip it uh, because of time. Uh, and, 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 and again, I, it has both Bayesian and frequent uh, control for multiplicity. The, the kind of answers you get are, are look like something like this. For each of the means, you, you summarize, again, the question is how do you summarize all the information? And a good summary of the information is, uh, the way I like to do it is put a bar at zero that indicates the posterior probability uh, that, that uh, ui is zero. And in this particular example, the posterior, the posterior probability that ui is zero is 0.45. So there's a significant chance that, that you're seeing nothing but noise, a 0.45 chance. Uh, but then you also say, if it's not zero, what's its posterior distribution of the effect size in ui? And that's this other posterior here. And that, that's a good kind of way to summarize the, the uh, uh, evidence from these kinds of Bayesian Actually, you're using evidence in the wrong way. To, to summarize the, the posterior distribution uh, of these kinds of problems. All right, uh, hierarchical modeling. I, mean, I, I, I think we're going to be hearing a lot about that. I thought, I thought I'd just do a very simple example for those who haven't seen it before. Then maybe the, the um, more complex example which would be easier to follow. Uh, so this is an, uh, this is, uh, an example of, like well, I said, the example of predicting the hazard from volcanic pyroclastic flows. So, so here's uh, Montserrat Island in, in the in, in uh, 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 
brilliant. And here's a volcano. And these little gray things that you see uh, going down there are, are pyroclastic flows from the volcano. This gray one right over here destroyed the capital city of the island. This gray one over here, there's an airport underneath there. Uh, so, so these are kind of nasty things. Um, and, and to predict how far these uh, pyroclastic flows go, one of the things that it's necessary to do is to learn the relationship between the volume of the flow and the friction of the flow on the ground. That's a, that's a key determinant in, in finding how far it's going to go. You know, it's, it's, it, gravity drives it down, friction slows it down. And you have to know the And it turns out that, that the, more, the, the higher volume the flow, the, the smaller is the friction on the ground. But they don't know how, they don't, they don't have a physical theory to predict that. So it has to be done statistically. So after some transformations, which I'm not going to get into, uh, it was reasonable to just model the friction related to the volume just by an ordinary regression equation. This was after suitable transformations. So we have unknown parameters, alpha i and theta i. Uh, and interestingly, we have this information from five different mountains. Okay. And the data from five different mountains, uh, here are the, the five different mountains each have a symbol here. Um, so you can kind of see the data from each five, and then just an ordinary regression line is, is fit through those data. Of, we're, we're mainly going to talk about this, this mountain Semeru uh, because of the fact that notice there's only four data points of Semeru, or one, two, three, four. Uh, and we're fitting a regression line here based on just four data points. Well, you know, that, that, that regression line is going to be incredibly uncertain. Um, uh, if all we did was we use those four data points. But when you do hierarchical modeling, you stop and say, well, now wait a minute. Uh, all five of these mountains are very similar in terms of the nature and their pyroclastic flow. Uh, one thought might be, why don't I just take all of this data together and, and just do one big regression and, and just say all of, all of the relationships between volume and, and uh, 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 friction are, are the same and fit one big regression. Um, but then you talk to the volcanologists and they say, no, that's not really right. Each of these mountains has a slightly different surface. They're not all, they're not all the same rock. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're all very related, but they're different. So that's when you do hierarchical modeling. You try to say, uh, uh, I, can't decide, I don't really want to combine everything together, but I know they're very related. And that's the whole uh, of hierarchical modeling. Um, in this particular case, the, the intercept scene would but were thought to be unrelated for various physical reasons. So they were all just assigned the usual objective prior, which is a constant. The slopes, however, were viewed to be highly related. And so they were modeled as simply the IID from the normal distribution. That normal distribution has two other parameters, which are typically called hyperparameters. Um, oh, and there was an unknown measurement variance in this case, which was assigned the usual objective prior one over sigma squared. And then these two hyperparameters uh, were assigned this particular objective prior, in other words, constant in, 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 in the mean C, and one over tau in the variance. And there's, certain, there's a number of reasons for choosing that particular hyper prior, which I, I don't have anything in. Uh, and then the posterior distribution, given the data, is just proportional to the product of the data likelihood and the prior. Give sampling, uh, basic MCMC technique, was done to obtain samples from the posterior. And then, and then mean regression lines and confidence bands for all of the mountains were developed. I'm going to, for the for four mountains that had uh, a lot of data, there was not much difference between uh, the answer from the Bayesian hierarchical, hierarchical analysis and least squares analysis. But let me, let me hop to several because you see a dramatic difference. Um, the black line is the, just the regression line if you, if you, um, uh, based it only on those four data points. And these dotted lines are the 95% are the confidence bands. So again, these confidence bands, you're very uncertain about what's going on uh, because there are only four data points. The hierarchical modeling uh, gave a slightly different mean regression line, that, that, that one there. And then it gave 95% confidence bands that are much, much higher. So where that's coming from, it's coming from using borrowing strength from the data on the other mountains to greatly improve the, the accuracy of the prediction for summer. Now, I mean, one has to be convinced that, that, that there is this relationship between the different mountains that we can exploit, 
for the volcanologists, uh, yes, yes, that's very clear in this case. We, we, we don't worry that that model is incorrect. So through hierarchical Bayesian analysis, you can get much more uh, precise answers uh, uh, in, in, in scenarios where there's one of the particular entities doesn't have enough data. Uh, okay, here's Bayes, Bayes and sort of big data. I mean, I, I was writing this down, Bayes and big data, and then I realized what you guys deal with. It's terabyte a second of data kind of stuff. And, and this is not bad. It's just Bayes and sort of big data. Uh, and and this, this comes from the problem of emulating a computer, computer model of pyroclastic flow. Um, and this is Gaussian process now. So, I mean, Gaussian processes is something, is something I, 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 I see you, you guys into. And so, this is something about Gaussian processes that, that may be of use. Um, so, so first up, let, let me talk about, about, about what this is, emulation, approximation of simulators. Uh, so a simulator is a complex computer model of a process, uh, often taking hours to weeks for a single run, uh, and, and making it impossible to use uh, for directly from intensive computations. So a crucial need is developing what's called an emulator, which is a fast, usually statistical approximation to the computer model. Uh, and, and my favorite ones are, are based on Gaussian processes. So, so this will be, an, we'll be seeing an application of Gaussian processes. Okay, here's our mountain again. Um, uh, the computer model called Titan 2D simulates what happens to a pyroclastic flow on Monster Rock. The pyroclastic flow starts at the top of the mountain. Uh, initial conditions, it has a volume V, the volume of the flow, how much mass starts out up there. Uh, and then it has a flow direction. You know, it's very different if it starts going here or it starts going here. So those are the two key initial conditions. There's these friction things, but I, I won't talk about that much. Uh, but, but these they feed into the computer model, and the computer model predicts, based on just PDE stuff uh, and digital elevation map that's built in, predicts how the flow will go down the mountain. Uh, it, it, it costs. Um, Okay, so it has those inputs or four inputs. Predicts the flow over a large space-time grid of points. X is the spatial points, T is the time points, and basically it's a, it's a space-time grid of size 10 to the 9th that the computer model will predict at each space and time, uh, 10 to the magnum. It will it'll say uh, what the what various properties of the flow um, given the, the initial inputs you feed it. And each run takes about two hours. Uh, so it's not, you can't use the simulator directly in any kind of MCMC or even an optimization. Um, so how do we build this emulator? Well, we run Titan 2D, this, this particular example, we ran it in 2048 different vectors of inputs. Okay? Each run uh, yielded a vector of data of size 10 to the 9. Okay, then this whole a uh, matrix of, of, of size 2048 times 10 to the 9 is our data. I mean, it's odd data. It's not data from, from the world. It's data from, from a computer. But uh, we're just going to treat it as data. Uh, and we are now going to use that data to try to build an approximation to the computer model. Okay, so, um, uh, and, and, and why? Because then when we have it, we're going to be able to predict the output of the computer model at inputs other than that initial 2048. And we, have, we, know, we know what the answer is at those 2048 inputs, but we need a fast way to find out what the computer model would predict everywhere else. Uh, we also want an emulator that provides an accuracy of the assessment of the prediction. Um, a little change of notation here. Uh, the emulator will be developed on the same space-time grid that Titan 2D is run on. Uh, and so I'm just going to replace one grid point, xt, by calling it a coordinate j of the emulator. So each coordinate j is a different grid point in, in space and time uh, uh, over which this, this uh, simulator is being run. Uh, and and, and, and uh, so when we first looked at this problem, we thought this is going to be effectively impossible. There's just too much data, too much. Um, too many things going on here. It's a complex problem to develop a simple and to, to, to develop a computationally feasible emulator. Well, we said, okay, I mean, you want that. Let's just try the simplest thing we could. And the simplest thing we could think of was model each coordinate as being independent. 
uh, by it being a Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process is not uh, is a non parametric Bayesian procedure. You just pretend I don't know this function at all. So I model this function by a non parametric Bayesian procedure, which, which is a Gaussian process. So I assign independent Gaussian processes to each of these. Uh, I choose Gaussian processes. If you don't know what Gaussian process is, don't worry. Uh, I'll just go quickly what, 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 what the components are. They have mean functions. Uh, and, and we said, okay, the simplest thing is just to assume they have regression form with respect to certain basis functions. X here, sorry, is, is just V phi delta that delta. Yeah. Um, and, and theta j, not, not the other x, I think the case went badly. Uh, and unknown theta j, uh, they have to have differing variance in sigma j squared. But we said, uh, to make this computation feasible, Gaussian processes have what are called correlation parameters. And we said, we'll use the same estimated correlation parameters parameters for each of the 10 of the 9 Gaussian processes we're modeling. We then just fed it into the, into the numerical system for analyzing, not the numerical system, the formulas for uh, uh, analyzing Gaussian processes, did some algebra, and lo and behold, we found that if we made those assumptions, uh, the emulator mean, which would be the best prediction of the simulator, and a new vector of inputs, was of a very simple form. It was just a linear function of um, uh, this massive data matrix. This, this was the 2048 runs of the simulator, so 2048 by 10 to the 9th data matrix. So to compute the emulator mean, all we have to do is take that thing and just multiply it by an, by an m vector. Uh, and this m vector requires only m squared computations, uh, which is not bad. Uh, remember that k is like 10 to the 9th, so the m squared computations here uh, is not, it's not expensive. The expensive part is simply multiplying an m vector times a m times 10 to the 9th um, uh, matrix. But that's only an m times k population, uh, computation. So linear, essentially a linear computation in, in, the, in the size of the problem k. And, and then when we saw that, we you know, were very excited because that, that's Bayes and big data can sort of have, have confidence. There's, there's two, two things you can do. One is you can kind of use some kind of divide and conquer strategy when you have big data and you want to do a Bayesian analysis. Or two, you can try something simple and hope that it works. And, and, and here we tried something simple and it worked beyond our wildest dreams because the answer came out uh, linear in the, in the size of the problem, which is K. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, it has some very nice properties. And, all of these Gaussian processes emulators are interpolators. So if you feed in, uh, if you feed in here any of the initial inputs of which you ran the simulator, it will give back um, uh, exactly what the simulator said. So, so it, it's doing exactly what the simulator would have done at those 2,048 points, and it's just smoothly interpolating everywhere else. Uh, it also produces a, um, oh, it, it, when you look at this, it's, it's a weighted average of the actual simulator runs, so it hopefully captures some of the dynamics of the process. Uh, there are emulator variances that you can compute. They're more expensive, but you literally have to do them all. And then, and then the, the, the most astonishing thing we discovered is that um, uh, a lot of people work hard on doing a, a, a joint-level Gaussian process with two different covariance structures. One covariance structure over the inputs, that's what I've been talking about. And then another covariance structure over the space time points. Because obviously you expect two points that are close in space and time to give very similar output. What we discovered is that latter is irrelevant. There's, there's no point in giving a space time process as long as you're only interested in the mean and the variance of the emulator. Is doing this simple one which ignores that spatial structure, just gives the same answer. I could talk about why that's so. It's another, it's another wonderful simplification. That if you're doing some of these complicated space time things, you often don't have to worry about all of the spatial structure that's going on. Um, just, just an example here, uh, we, we just picked uh, some new input values. Uh, and then here is the mean of the emulator. I, I, I could figure out how to do movies in here. Uh, so I, I just picked a different thing, maybe the maximum flow height, well, flow height over time. So I could, I could uh, uh, just plot that, because that, that's, that's something I'm the most interested in. If you're, if you're at a particular point on the island and a pyroclastic flow is coming at you, you care about what the, what the maximum of the height is. You know, that's basically it. Uh, 
to determine whether you look at I or you're building in or um, and, and, and so it's a very rough surface. Uh, you know, mountains are complicated things. The maximum flow height uh, over the mountain, so we chop it off in the center, uh, is, is, is this kind of very rough surface. Um, this, this uh, and, 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 and I said the, the emulator also produces a variance estimator, so you have an idea as to how, how accurate you are. Now, when you look at this, it, it looks, wait a minute, but that doesn't look very accurate. Those are like big variances. But the scales here, so you can't read them, are different. The, the maximum scale here is 20 meters. So these, you know, this is about, this maximum flow height here is like 18 meters or something like that. Uh, the variance, this, this the height here is 0.12. So, so these are very small variances. Um, uh, so, 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 the, so the idea, so the, it seems that the emulator is running incredibly accurate uh, a prediction of a very complex uh, simulator process. All right. I'm anyway, well, let me let me just do this fast. Um, uh, uh, so, so again, this is this is the. I, I don't I, I don't imagine that, that, that in exoplanets anymore or astronomy in general there's that much of a Bayesian frequency debate anymore. Or is there? Is there a debate? <laughs> The what? Who's that other guy you mentioned? <laughs> the frequencies, yes, who are they? <laughs> anyway, let me let me let me let me just let me just say uh, uh, how that that debate is is, is is sort of disappearing, um, uh, starting to disappear in, in areas where it was um, um, uh, quite strong. And and I, all, all I can show you is one is one very simple example. Um, uh, and and this is this is the this is the setup of classical hypothesis testing. Um, so we observe data from the density, and we want to test a null hypothesis versus an alternative. So the classical frequentist thing to do is to specify a rejection region R, compute the type one, type one error, and compute the power. Okay? So that's the error is the probability of rejection under the null, the power is the probability of rejection under the alternative, which typically depends on the value of theta under the alternative. So we're going to be mixing up Bayes and frequentist here. So let pi zero and pi one be the prior probabilities of each. Uh, and again, I have to have a prior density of theta under H1, which frequentists often just choose that to be the point mass. They say, I want to evaluate power at theta equals five. Uh, that's equivalent to choosing the prior to put all of its weight on theta equals five. That's okay. Uh, then we get an average power, uh, and then also we have the evidence, the Bayesian evidence. Okay, so we're mixing up Bayesian frequentists, but there's a reason for it. Now, now, here's a very good uh, pre-experimental analysis, which is not new, which is but that it's something frequentists need to do routinely. Uh, uh, fre frequentists often just report alpha, and maybe report the power, but people don't know what to do with that. But for a while now, in various disciplines, people have been saying, okay, I want to report what are called the pre-experimental odds of correct to incorrect rejection of h naught. Let's think about that a minute. It says, before I run the experiment, what is the chance that if I get a rejection, what is the chance that it's correct rejection, that the null is actually wrong, compared to the chance that the null hypothesis was true and I just, by noise, got a rejection? That, that's a great quantity to think of. The pre experimental odds of you're getting a correct result to an incorrect result when you reject. Uh, you can just show. That it can be written uh, by, by, by a version of Bayes theorem. It can be shown to be written as, as a product of the prior odds, where you think ahead of time as to the chance that the null hypothesis is true or false. And then it's times the ratio of the power to the type 1 error. So there's the key is that the way to interpret power and type 1 error is to look at the ratio and interpret it as the odds that the experiment will correctly reject. To incorrectly reject. Uh, this should become a major part of all statistical practice: is reporting that quantity as the key measure of, of, the, of the value of the experiment. We call that the rejection odds of H1 and H0. Now I'm running out of time, uh, but the basic thing is I'm going to stop here at this slide. What is the Bayesian? That's pre-experimental. That's that's power over alpha. That's before I see the experiment. Uh, a Bayesian says, well, no, I, I want to be post-experimental odds. So a Bayesian would say, I want the odds, that same odds, the, the probability of null to the alternative, the odds of that, 
Um, and that again would be the prior odds, but now it would be times what's called the Bayes factor, which is the ratio of the evidence under the alternative hypothesis and the evidence under null. So a Bayesian would, would uh, report that and report the Bayes factor. Um, well, here, here's, here's the, the, the kind of result that I ran across a, 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 about a year ago, and, and how fascinating is that it's a, it's a, it's a simple computation. Um, let, me, let me just go to the formula and talk about it. Uh, uh, and just talk about it. If, if I look at the Bayes factor and I take its expectation under the null hypothesis and over the rejection region, I get exactly the rejection odds. I get exactly uh, power over alpha. What that means, uh, according to previous reasoning, if my average base factor is equal to the pre-experimental quantity, then the base factor itself is fully frequent. So, so, so this is the this is sort of what's happening. Is that at least at least in the simpler statistical problems, we're finding that if we do the sort of the Bayesian procedure the right way, it ends up being a procedure that has a fully frequent property. So, so you, you, you get the same answer. There's no conflict anymore. Uh, there's a conflict with the unconditional frequency answer, but that's just because it's, you know, unconditional is not right. You're averaging over all the data. Uh, you want something that's data dependent, as long as that data dependent thing has the correct average, and it's still fully frequent. So I'll just I'll just leave that uh, uh, there. But so frequency based, even philosophically, the difference is kind of disappearing. It's been discovered that when you do it right, you get the same answer uh, either way. And uh, with that, I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you very much for talking to us. We have time for a couple of questions. There's just one thing I wanted to say. Um, if the students are willing to give the PDF of their slides for the archive on our website, it would be very, very cool. And so if the speakers could do that by giving them to Paul, um, that would be great. We can't actually get them ourselves to the speaker ready. We don't have the right to do that. So, um, okay, so we have time for a couple of questions before we can ask you. You persuaded me to get the same answer to that question. Is that always the question you want to ask? Um, the probability you know, that, that, that's, that's right, 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 correctly, incorrectly rejected. Right, that, that's exactly the point. It's the, it's the um, one, one of these strengths, one, one of the big appeals of the amazing approach is that you can ask it any question you wish, and and it will it will give you an answer. Uh, the frequency approach is, is much more limited than the number of questions you can ask. And so, and, and so I, 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 I should have said the bigger question, both for the answer. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, 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 the questions that have a, what, 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 what I found, like in this case, um, the, in, even in the simple testing scenario, the Bayesians and frequentists could not come to an agreement until the frequentists posed what I think is the correct question. And we must be, Odds of correct and incorrect rejection. Uh, and once that question is posed, it's a quantity that's also very interpretable to base, and then the duality of two answers appears. Yeah. So I think almost all, or maybe literally all of the, the basic examples that you posed had this flavor of traditional hypothesis testing. There is a null hypothesis, you might just shoot it down. The alternative hypothesis is that some parameter is literally anything but zero or five or whatever. And we can often phrase astrophysical tests in that way. What is the number? If there is one planet or three planets with a mass larger than half an Earth mass in this RBK set. But a lot of times we're, we're in a more continuous limit where there's some number of planets of arbitrary masses. And that seems like the, the prior rates become almost by definition unnormalizable. And so, is there any guidance that we can draw from this, or is there more exciting research or something you can just comment on quickly that, that could point to something useful in that direction where you don't have these discrete roles, which is sort of continuously controlled parameter set? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I
So I, the, the, sorry, the, the, the questions of um, choosing priors and the, 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 the kind of context where you're talking about this is it's inherently problematic. It's the prior is now. I mean, you, you all, you'll, you'll just find that if you vary, if you, if you vary the width of the prior or something, the answers will just change dramatically. So all, 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 all you can do is, is, is um, do sensitivity studies to reasonable changes in the prior and hope, and hope that, that um, um, the answer is fairly stable over there. But it's, it's not. No <laughs> Um, it's a little bit along the lines of what Will was asking. So, uh, one of the areas that I think we have a lot to learn is in the design of priors based on um, domain knowledge. And exactly, you know, we have a lot of domain knowledge, but we are not very expert, I think, in um, translating that into priors. And I wonder if there are any generic methodologies that exist that we could read about and see if they might apply to all sorts of problems. Um, and I'm thinking about whether there's anything, for example, based on the dynamics of a particular system or anything like that that we could use to learn how to design our prior more effectively. Um, gosh, I mean, there, there's, so there's a huge um, literature on, on listening priors, but it's it's it's, it's different. It's, it's more aimed at like expert expert uh, opinion elicitation, not converting scientific knowledge into priors. Uh, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I've, I've participated in the in the, in the process with, with astronomers converting scientific knowledge into, into priors, and, it, and, it, and we usually have a, a useful dialogue because I know more about developing priors and they know much more about the scientific knowledge, and then through the through a conversation. We, Advance. Uh, but I, 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 can't, I can't make a reference. Okay. Are there any more questions? Um, if not, we will break now and we reconvene at 2 p.m. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that all the speakers for this afternoon's session have uploaded their talks um, on the system. If there is anyone who hasn't, please go to the speaker venue room. It's right the other side of the sort of lobby on this level. 3178. 3178.